practical thing to me, and uh, I always want to make sure we can hear them, and you're doing great. Um, this is the time set for uh, oral argument in uh, our case number CV190659, Maricopa County versus uh, Rovi. Um, Council, we have set this for oral argument for 20 minutes for each side. Uh, if appellant wishes to reserve a portion of your time for uh, rebuttal, you're free to do so. Um, but you need to keep track of your own time. In more normal times, we would have a beautiful podium with a podium clock for you to look at. Instead, it is a smartphone in my hand um, that will <laughs> keep the time today. Uh, appellant, I, or Ms. Markoff, I will let you know if you wish to reserve some time, how much time you have uh, by my clock uh, when you end with your uh, with your opening argument. Um, we, this is being recorded, so I would ask that you um, let let um, d announce uh, when you begin your presentation your name and the party that you represent uh, for ease of. Uh, posterity. We are familiar with your case. We have reviewed um, the briefs carefully and the record, and we'd encourage you to keep that in mind uh, as you present oral argument today. With that, Ms. Markoff, you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Cassandra Markoff, and also appearing today is Dale Zeitlin, both with the law firm of Zeitlin and Zeitlin, on behalf of the appellants, the Robies. I am cognizant of the fact that your honors have read the briefs and the record, and I do not want to just read you our brief today, but there are several points I wish to emphasize during my time this morning. Uh, there are two overarching issues on appeal in this case. The first is whether the county has previously acquired an easement to the at issue public roadway, which crosses the Roby's land that they own in fee. And the second, if the county does not possess such an easement, whether the Rovies have a viable claim for either inverse condemnation or trespass or both. As to the first overarching issue concerning the county's rights to an easement, I want to begin by pointing out the procedural posture of this case, and that is that it is up on appeal from a motion for summary judgment. This is important because there is simply not enough evidence and maybe no evidence in the record to support a finding by the trial court that the county acquired a roadway easement over the Rovi's land. Council, do I recall though correctly that this came to us from cross motions for summary judgment or is that misrecalling things? That's correct, Your Honor. It was cross motions. So at that time, at least both parties thought there was no factual issue to see it w It could be resolved on motion. Fair? That's correct, Your Honor. And that is still our position today. There is just no evidence to support the finding of any type of ownership interest by the county in this roadway. Um, and that is because the county may never adversely possess a public roadway by easement or otherwise nor may it condemn it via easement interest to establish a roadway. Rather, it must condemn land for a roadway in fee as required by the eminent domain statutes. For that reason, the county may only have acquired this easement found by the trial court to the at issue roadway one of two ways, either through a common law dedication by the landowners or by establishing an RS-2477 roadway back in the 19 teens and 20s before the land became private. The trial court did not go over the requisite findings for establishing either of these two easements. However, I will go over both briefly and demonstrate the lack of evidence to support both. Um, I will address the common law dedication first. In Arizona, um, as discussed in the brief, a common law dedication can only be established with a full demonstration of the intent of the donor to dedicate. Now, this demonstration must be clear, satisfactory, and unequivocal. There is no evidence in the record to meet the standard of proving an intent to dedicate the at issue easement. Even the trial court recognized in its minute entry that, and I quote, no evidence appears in the record that prior owners of the property expressly permitted the obstruction caused by the roads on the property. The single piece of evidence the county points to is language excluding the at-issue roadway in a warranty deed. 
As recognized by the Arizona Court of Appeals, that type of exclusionary language has never been enough to constitute a clear, satisfactory, and unequivocal demonstration of an intent to dedicate. That's the law in Arizona. Let me ask you, um, that implicates, as I understand it, the tips and gores concept, right? That, that, uh, and I think the case is called Brown, um, that, um, that both you cited or, or your client cited in front of the Superior Court and the Superior Court adopted. And tips and gores, you know, the primary aspect, which has been accepted in Arizona, is you take the land to the center of the roadway. But mm-hmm. the corollary that Brown recognized was if it's subject to the roadway or the transfer or something like that, it carves out an, an easement for the use of that roadway. Um, it's sort of that corollary um, aspect of tips and gores that I, I'm interested in because that's that's as I read this the Superior Court's minute entry, sort of what the Superior Court ended with. Correct, Your Honor. However, under Arizona law, uh, even under that doctrine, the county only could have established the easement through a common law dedication or an RS-2477 um, roadway interest. It, it Because the Rovies own that land in fee under strips and gores means that the county only could have acquired an easement either by, by statute or by dedication exception in Arizona. If, if in fact, it was in under the strips and gores, it was given subject to the easement, it would have had to have been either through the county condemning, which the county can't condemn via easement. They have to condemn in fee for a roadway right away, having the dedication or an RS-2477. There's just no other exception. Um, and that is why I'm focusing on the factors for either common law dedication or RS-2477 today, because there just simply isn't enough evidence to support those factors. Even and under with the, the 20, st- with the 2477 aspect, where would I find that in your briefing? Um, the 2477 roadway, which was um, really first introduced in the answering brief, it, that really wasn't briefed too much down at the trial court, um, that's in our reply brief in the first legal argument section. Okay, so not in your opening brief. Um, I believe we, um, in broad strokes, covered that there was there was no method, legal method, by which the county could have acquired um, any type of easement. And the answering brief then explained that maybe they could do it through this RS-2477 method, which by the way, the trial court never even addressed in the minute entry. And then in the reply, we explained why that just, if, if the court of appeals were inclined to uphold the lower court based on that um, method of finding an easement, even then, there wouldn't be sufficient evidence in the record for the Court of Appeals to do that. So that but that is why it was addressed that way. Just to be clear, though, the trial court was not asked to address that. Um, I believe it was briefly mentioned in the cross motion in a the response to Rovi's cross motion, um, but the. I don't think that was as extensively briefed as it was in the um, answering brief and the reply in front of the Court of Appeals. No. Very well. Okay. Um, and just to just to finish on the common law dedication, um, the the only evidence is this exclusionary language, which is, which is not enough, and that is because this typically only occurs because title companies will not insure those strips of land that are purported or declared roads. Um, and for that reason, even in Arizona, courts have held that this exclusionary language does nothing more than cloud title. Uh, it's something that just needs to be cl- cl- clarified, you know, via court action. And what With, the 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 case that you just mentioned or cases on clouding title for a 33 foot reservation for example what what is your best case on that front i believe that's the tucson v Morgan case okay and that deals with the reservation of an easement this sort of second aspect of tips and gores or something different not a reservation of an easement 
because it is our position, it's the Rovi's position that there is no, there is no ex exclusion of an easement in these warranty deeds. It's just exclusionary language from the warranty itself. They're, the title companies and, and the sellers are not warranting that they own that land because for many reasons, it, it's a purported or dedicated road and they don't want to have to defend a legal action such as this one. Um, if a, a, buyer ends up having a dispute like this. So, so your, your position is that the language, for example, and the, the, the deeds use different text to be sure, but um, that that land was transferred, quote, except the north 33 feet for road, that that's simply uh, expedient for title insurance as opposed to what transferred under that document? Absolutely. Yes, that is our position. Um, and I, I think that's position that position is supported even further. If you read the warranty deed, it actually explicitly excludes other easements, for example, for the flood district, says excluding the easement for the flood district. If this were a, an e a recognized easement, then it wouldn't say excluding this 33 strip of land, but it would say something akin to excluding this, the roadway, the 33 strip of land by, for the county roadway for public use or something like that um, where it recognizes that there is some ownership interest by the public or by the county in a roadway. Instead, it's just merely excluding the 33 feet because title companies and sellers aren't willing to have to in, in some future date um, get called on to you know represent a buyer in relation to an action like this one. So your your position is that exclusion as to the ownership rights did sort of nothing to the um, downstream purchaser of the land like the Rovies that that I mean it, it's hard for me to see that exclusion and not think it did something. I think what it did was it protected the sellers and the title company from any liability in the future that this um, strip of land might actually be owned by the county because no one actually knew. And in fact, no one knew until the trial court uh, in this case found that the Rovies owed in fee. So really it acted as a, a warranty. Um, it really just insulated the title company and previous sellers from any future liability. Um, in other words, because there's this cloud on title, because there is a 33 foot strip roadway on the land, a seller didn't want a warranty they owned it, and then in the future have to litigate the claim. Instead, it's on the, the buyer, the subsequent purchasers, if they're inclined to, to have to litigate who owns what, which was done in this case, and the trial court found that the Rovies owned it in fee. And we Sub can subject Subject to and a use of that land, right? Subject to a, an easement. However, the court, the trial court still needed to find that the county acquired the easement in a legally permissible way. I don't think it's an, it would, and it would have to be a common law dedication. You would have to find that this language saying excluding the 33 feet was a common, amounted to a common law dedication, which and, in and Arizona let me ask you though, um, if if the dispute is between the county and the Rovies, and that it really is, um, does the court really need to go further than to do something other than finding the Rovies have the land subject to this easement, and so there's no taking there? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, your thought is the, the court needs to find, do, do more. Um, find how this sort of came to be held by the county. It, did the court really need to do that other than to find that the Robies didn't hold it? Absolutely, because here in Arizona, we have we have a a strict way in which these counties or any municipality can establish public highways. And that's either through condemning in fee, or getting a dedication. And there are clear prohibitions against the county ever adversely possessing land, which the Gotland and Dawson courts took extremely seriously right. um, and, and focused on. So if we were to say that there wasn't a common law dedication, there wasn't an RS 2477, and um, they didn't condemn in fee, but they got this easement by use, well then they, 
adversely possess the public highway, which in Arizona can simply never happen under Gotland or Dawson or the Arizona Constitution, according to the, the, the Arizona Supreme Court in those two cases. So um, I, I do submit to you that he, absolutely the trial court needed to to crouch the finding of an easement in a legally permissible manner. Otherwise, I don't see how it doesn't run afoul of Gotlin and Dawson and the Arizona Constitution, the takings clause. Um, is that all in your on that issue? It, it is. Yes. Thank oh, you. Yes. OK, um, and um, there are a few points I'd like to make and then I'll reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. So I would just quickly, um, I think that summarizes the common law dedication issue on the RS 2477 roadway. I, we run into the exact same issue. There just isn't evidence in the record that would support a finding that there was used by the public on these roadways or even if the roadways existed at the time the land uh, turned to public hands. Um, just a mere resolution of an approved roadway or a resolution that the roads may be opened, again, not enough that that evidence can't sustain an RS-2477 roadway. Um, and even the patents uh, converting the land to private hands in 1920 and 1927 did not con contain any exception language for the Adishu roads, but do include exception language for other county roads, um, which just provides evidence that the roads were not in existence at these times. And ultimately, under either theory, there's just simply not evidence. Um, and one final point, and I did briefly touch on this regarding the Gotland and Dawson line of cases and the Arizona uh, Constitution's prohibition against adversely possessing um, a public highway. If we were to find that the exception language in these warranty deeds alone, which is almost certainly the, the case in which is almost certainly the case in any any roadway like this, any any piece of land that has a public roadway that wasn't acquired in a legally permissible way, either via statute or dedication, will include this language excluding the 33 feet. This is just how title companies work. They're not going to insure it because they don't want to have to defend against a county that might actually have a, a right to these roadways just via condemnation, but th this is how the counties did it before. They would just declare these roads and eventually in the future at some point these roads would be would be used by the public. That is simply not enough to establish a public highway in Arizona under any of the legally permitted ways. Otherwise, you are taking land without just compensation for public use. Um, I will reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. And counsel, for your planning purposes, I have you with about three and a half minutes um, for rebuttal. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mom. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Scott Malm of the law firm Gus Rosenfeld, uh, representing the Maricopa County. Uh, with me on the line listening is Jean Rice, who is also counsel of record for this matter. Um, I see that I'm at 1034 approximately, so uh, with the 20 minutes, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the clock there. Uh, judge, I want to, judges, I want to make, uh, your honors, I want to make clear that there are three roads at issue here, and they do have a little bit of a distinction, so I want to make that clear. We have the Perryville Road, which was not part of any of the quiet title issues, so that does need to be treated a little differently. Then we have Jackrabbit and Yuma Roads. So I actually want to start off, although the, the bulk of the time spent in the uh, uh, Ms. Markov's argument was on the quiet title, I actually want to start on the statute of limitations issue for the trespass and the inverse condemnation damages issue because that applies to all three. So first on the trespass uh, issue with the statute of limitations, um, the court, the lower court reached the right result based on two Arizona Supreme Court cases adopting the standard of is this a permanent trespass or is it something less than that? Is it some kind of continuing thing? If this was just a dirt roadway, maybe that would not be deemed permanent enough because it might be uh, so intermittent with vehicles and it may not be enough. But when it's paved, when it's regularly maintained, that is a physical presence. That is, um, in the words of the restatement that was actually cited 
in the uh, and in the reply brief uh, on this issue. In the words of the restatement, it talks about if you dispossess somebody. Well, that's exactly what happens when it's more than just a dirt roadway. There is asphalt laid, and you have at a minimum a hundred cars, up to a thousand cars on these roads going through. So I just want to emphasize that point that the lower court reached the right result by finding that there the statute of limitations on any trespass claim expired long ago because the evidence showed that at least prior to 1980, the three roads were constructed, they were paved, and they were regular that pavement was regularly maintained with cars at least a hundred up to a thousand cars a day. In, in, in your honor, yes, the uh, city of Phoenix and the city of Tucson uh, cases that were cited by the lower court on that statute of limitations and trespass issue um, ultimately held that there was not uh, a permanency there uh, because one involved odors from a sewage system or uh, there was water flow from a negligent pipe, um, very distinct from a road. And so although there's no Arizona case specifically holding with regard to a road, we did cite uh, for you in our briefing the Kentucky case, a federal uh, judge, uh, federal court in Kentucky, uh, Bickett v. Country Mark Energy, which did hold a similar road as being permanent. So um, unless you have any questions, I'm going to move away from the statute of limitations and trespass issue. Very well. Second issue, the, the right to inverse condemnation damages. So again, regardless of what you might find on the quiet title issue, the Rovies simply are not entitled to any inverse condemnation damages because the taking involved here for these roadways, again, occurred before 1980, long before the Rovies came into title. And that's not just my opinion on what the law is here. That's the Arizona Supreme Court in the Boyd case from 1931. And that language is so specific. The damages belong to the owner at the time of the taking. Well, at the time of the taking, that would have been long before the Rovies took it, so they don't have an interest there. And it does not, in the continuation of the quote, and do not pass to a grantee of the land under a deed made subsequent to that time unless expressly conveyed therein. And there was no evidence offered in the lower court or in the appellate briefing that there was any conveyance of the right to the condemnation damages that would have arisen had there been... Uh, would, which would have arisen when the uh, road was constructed at least sometime before 1980. So and we've got the wrong you, party you, just you, too late. You, just to clarify, you get there under Boyd not because of what the deeds say that the Rovies took title under, it's what they don't say. Is that fair? That, that's correct, because there's nothing in the deeds that say or any other contract. It wouldn't actually need to be in a deed. It could be even in a regular contract. We, the current owner, uh, hold the right to inverse condemnation damages, and we hear I convey that to the Rovies or somebody else. There's just nothing like that in the right. record. Okay. Um, and, and I wanted to address the issue because it may come up on a rebuttal. Um, the Calmet case from 1993 um, in Arizona, another Arizona Supreme Court case, confirms we're talking about inverse condemnation here. So the taking occurs in inverse condemnation when the property is taken, when the event happens. So there was some argument in, in the uh, opening brief about, you know, the taking doesn't happen until the money's paid or something later. That's just not the situation in an inverse condemnation. So again, un unless you have any questions about the uh, inverse condemnation damages, I'll move to really the focus, which has been the quiet title issue. Very well. Uh, on the quiet title issue, um, I, I agree with counsel that uh, there is case authority for establishing this roadway by common law dedication. And she also mentioned the RS 2477, the federal statute. The court, the lower court's decision could also be understood as somewhat creating a third uh, way of doing it, which would be the language of the deeds themselves in conjunction with the Strips and Gore Doctrine. So, uh, just to you were asking some questions there earlier about the Strips and Gore Doctrine, that it has to mean something when the courts agree that you own up to the middle of the road, but then if that same deed says, except for the roadway, which or whatever language is used for roadway purposes, 
that language too has to be given meaning. And so, Council, before before you get to that, because I want to hear your thoughts on that, but what you are not saying that the Superior Court found there was a common law dedication or this roadway was created by federal statute, correct? Um, clearly the court did not say on the federal statute that this roadway existed based on that. Clearly no. Okay. Clearly the lower court did not use the specific language about a common law dedication. That is accurate. Instead, what it appears the lower court did was rely on the strips and gore doctrine and the actual language itself, which I'm, 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 I'm going to argue to you would be an opportunity for this court in, again, approving the strips and gore doctrine to affirm the lower court's decision based solely on the language itself and the strips and gore doctrine, that that would be enough for those private owners to have created a roadway at that time. I just want to understand your position because I don't read the minute entry as um, saying an express common law dedication, setting aside this third argument that you are going to get to when I quit talking um, or created under fe by a federal statute. It's really the third strips and gores plus the corollary on the deed language, right, which is unknown as of this moment to published law in Arizona, right, which causes us to not get squeamish maybe, but to listen really carefully, recognizing property transfers and roads have been happening in Arizona since territorial days. And that, that doctrine, that aspect, the corollary hasn't been adopted before this case. Agreed. And to clarify, before I get into the details of that argument itself, the court could still affirm based on what's in the record, finding a common law dedication because enough was introduced to affirm the decision as you may for any reason in the record. And also under the federal statute, you may affirm under either of those, shall we say more uh, established means of establishing roads in Arizona. You can still affirm based on those, even though the judge, uh, lower court, court judge did not specifically apply either of those. I want to make that make that very clear. Uh, so, uh, so yes, we are recognizing that the one way that the judge seemed to have done it is through uh, the common law uh, idea of strips and gores, the language. And this court wouldn't be stepping out completely out on a ledge because at least two cases uh, from other jurisdictions, uh, from Texas and Oregon, uh, the Lewis case and the Rawl case that were cited by the lower court, not addressed by uh, appellants in their briefing. But those two cases do talk about the strips and gores uh, concept and how to create these easement this way and looking at the language only. So yes, this would be something new for you in a published sense, but uh, you would not be alone recognizing that also has been recognized in other, other cases. Unless you have any other questions, I wanna move to the second, the common law dedication because Yes, that is a recognized, uh, well-established way of, of creating roads. The Pleak v. Entrada case from 2004, Arizona Supreme Court case, um, was probably the last, uh, most recent decision by the court, the Supreme Court to outline the way you create that. And here's the specific language. No particular words, ceremonies, or form of conveyance is necessary to dedicate land to public use. Anything fully demonstrating the intent of the donor to dedicate can suffice. Now, we recognize the lower court said there was nothing expressly dedicating um, or conveying or allowing the construction of the roads, but the language in the deeds need to be given some meaning. And that would fall under this language under plea of any act, um, any words, uh, anything fully demonstrating the intent. Well, if it wasn't the intent of the grantors to recognize this kind of road over that land, then what did it mean? And the only answer we have heard is, oh, that language just relates to the warranty. That is, that is only a partial description. That's not a precise uh, analysis there. And this gets into some, you know, uh, you know, the habendum clause and some of those words that we all may remember from, you know, real property class many years ago. 
but there are two very distinct portions of the deed. There's the conveyance language that would include the granting clause and the habendum clause. So for example, the granting clause, I, Scott Mall grant to Gene Rice, lot two, except the West uh, 20 feet. That's the, that's the granting clause because I am telling who's involved in the grant and I'm explaining what's being granted, a specific area of land, okay? Then you have the habendum clause, which is how do they hold it? Are they taking it in fee title? Are they taking a life estate? Are they taking it in some way that way? That's all part of the conveyance language. What, what Ms. Markoff was discussing was the warranty language, which is very different. And that language, when you read it, it says that the grantor warrants the above referenced or identified premises. In other words, what's up already in the granting clause is what they're going to warrant. Well, then you have to go up to the front and say, well, what was granted? So it's not precise enough to say, oh, the warranty is only limited to discussing that exception language or for road purposes. Yes, that is affected. The warranty is affected by what is granted, but that isn't to say that it still wasn't granted or clarified or identified as what would be conveyed. And so that's why this argument that, oh, the exceptions or exclusions is only for the purpose of title company protection or warranty limitations is just not accurate because that language is in the conveyance language uh, identifying what is being conveyed to whom and the description of how it's to be held as in subject to this roadway easement. So your honor, the question then for an under P under Pleak is simply, is there language indicating, suggesting, demonstrating the intent of the donor to dedicate? We say that was in the record for you to affirm because the language is in those deeds and you have to give some meaning to that language. And then the second part under Pleak is that there is actual public use and no one has disputed that there was actual public use here because there was clearly use going back to the you know, demonstrated by the 1980 uh, report about at least 100 cars, maybe up to 1,000 cars going through that. So our position is we ask you to affirm the lower court's decision, either because the judge did it right in applying strips and gores or because the judge did it right on the common law dedication. If there's no other questions about the common law dedication, then I'll go to the third basis of which the court, this court could affirm, and that's this... Uh, federal statute, RS 2477. And yes, uh, you know, for real estate uh, nerds like me, going back to cases or to statutes from 1866 from the federal government, that's kind of interesting. And, and, and you know, I like these kinds of cases. And um, this, the issue here is, was there a public road established under state law before the patents were issued beginning in 1921. And as we showed in our briefing, and as we explained to the lower court um, uh, before, which the court just didn't have to reach because the court reached uh, and ruled in our favor on the first issue, the state statutes uh, at that time, 1913, talked provided the way that this would happen. And we provided you copy, we provided the lower court, uh, and it's in the record, the resolution, identifying the petition, how that process came to be. We, we identified how that the map is actually recorded to identify those roads. And this wasn't, and, and to show that this wasn't some just, uh, you know, mistake in the night uh, trying to hide it from somebody, we also provided you the evidence that there were uh, maps recorded in uh, 1921 uh, by the county showing these roads, which indicates they must have thought they had done something, and they did in 1919. There's the 1937 map from the Arizona Highway Department with the United States Department of Agriculture for the Public Roads Bureau, uh, also identifying these as roads. So, so this wasn't something that was uh, uh, hidden from anybody. This was accomplished pursuant to state law in 1919 as to Jackrabbit and Yuma. Um, now, what uh, appellant has argued is, well, that's not enough because you also have to condemn and they rely on the Morgan case, the city of Tucson Morgan case, appellate 1970 case. 
And the reason that doesn't apply is because this was federal land in 1919. You don't need to condemn federal land because the federal government already said, hey, you all may have uh, public roads as long as you do it according to state law. And here's the process. So there wouldn't have been a condemnation action in 1919 because there was no private ownership at that time. So just to wrap it up uh, on our position, we ask that you affirm on the quiet title issue under any of the three options that are available to you. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Um, Ms. Markoff, uh, rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to first address this um, unrecognized possible third method of finding a public highway easement. That's never been recognized in Arizona, and uh, that would completely run afoul of the Arizona Constitution and the holdings in Dawson and Gotlin. Um, also, the support for that are cases cited in Texas and Oregon, other jurisdictions, which are completely irrelevant because in those states, the government can adversely possess interests in public highways where they can't hear. So any holdings by states like that are completely um, irrelevant because any finding of this quote unquote third method would be what, regardless of what you call it, an adverse possession of land. Um, and that also brings me back, your, um, your Honor, to your question about the Brown case. That case involved actually a railroad which can adversely possess um, easements and other types of interests in public highways or right-of-ways where the government can't. So that case didn't run afoul of Dawson or Gotland, but um, some finding of a third method here, I just don't see how you get around those cases that are clear, no public highway by prescription. Um, and any holding that either the passage of time or ownership eliminates an inverse claim for a public highway creates a blanket rule that effectively eviscerates all currently outstanding claims that the Dawson court stated could not be affected with no notice without depriving a landowner of his property without just compensation. They said you would have to give these landowners notice. And that court was fully cognizant of any statute of limitations or other issues that there might be. And um, um, I guess it's a, it's a little bit of a hook on this point. Uh, back to the Boyd case cited by appellees, in Arizona, a condemnation prece proceeding is an action in REM. It is not the taking of rights of designated persons, but the taking of the property itself. Um, so, again, that would... Um, that would also pass to a subsequent landowner. And finding otherwise, I would argue, also would violate Dawson and Gotland. And in one of those cases, it was a subsequent landowner. Um, and one final point, whether it be through the warranty deed language or the conveyance language that ex accepted this 33 foot strip of land, even in the cases cited by the appellees, that makes no difference. Um, and that would be the Cottonwood case cited in the appellee's answering brief that states that if land abutting on a public way is conveyed by a description covering only the lot itself, nevertheless, the grantee takes title to the center line of the public way if the grantor owned the underlying fee, which the Rovies own the underlying fee in this case. That has not been appealed. And that, that court explains that rule and says the rule stems from recognition, this is not a quote, that landowners tend to overlook any interest they may have in abutting roadways and presumes that they had been, if they had been cognizant of their interests, that would have been included in the conveyance. So that's why it's excluded. And no one with these historic highways that can stem back to territorial days, it's completely understandable that uh, these landowners are not fully aware of their rights and, it, the, and nor is the county uh, taking even this case, the county said the Robies didn't own the land, but a court has now found they own the land and fee under strips and gores. Any other conclusion, Your Honor, I think would violate Dawson or Gotland. Thank you. Council, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your presentation today. We appreciate your briefing. Uh, you've given us much to think about. We will take the matter 
uh, under advisement and we'll issue a written ruling in due course. Um, with that, court is adjourned. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors.